we're not just a junkyard. Um, the stuff does not come out here and just park and sit and, and rust and deteriorate. Don Olson is in the business of recycling. Combat vehicles, um, tanks, armor personnel carriers, um, trailers, trucks, um, fuel tankers, water tankers, um, heavy construction equipment. Bulldozers, it's light sets, it's gators, it's ATVs. This is the Sierra Army Depot. It is a 36,000 acre patch of land in Herlong, California. And it is where the military and the Army stores their equipment and actually sends it out so that it doesn't have just one life but two, pinching every penny and every dollar so that taxpayer money isn't wasted after the war is finally over. Um, this stuff has been used once. Um, and we bring that value back by having it being reused again. Sierra is America's largest repository of military equipment returning from war. 26,000 vehicles and over $1 billion worth of clothing have been shipped here on planes, trucks, and trains. If it can still shoot, roll, or otherwise function, Don and his team take it into inventory, fix it up, and ship it right back out to troops. And we're not just talking about big ticket items. So you can see the workers here that are actually processing the material. They're opening the boxes to see if what's inside. It's an in engine starter. Um, I don't know, hundreds of dollars um, for a big truck. There's cables. Um, there's filter systems. There's a steering wheel. It's not sexy stuff. But if we did not do this, the Army would be buying all of this again. And they're not having to do that now. How many different types of things, tidbits, are we are we talking about here? Um, millions. Um, literally anything that's in the Army supply system, we could receive here. Anything. So it's kind of like a big Home Depot where it, they can just go it, to it, the it, ILC four. Yeah, it it, it kind of is. In an age where the military's belt is tightening through sequestration, drawdowns, and troop cuts, anyone who can save the Pentagon a penny is quite an asset. One stark example. Armor used in soldiers' vests. Previously, we would throw these away, and the Army would buy a new one, about 500 bucks. And we got with the manufacturer, and we said, look, can, can we do something to this to make it usable again for the soldier at a cost savings to the Army? So we now have a process we've identified where we can fix all of these little def deficiencies that are on the end. And the process is simple. Heat the area up, she'll apply this, the tape on there, and seal it back on. It's permanently sealed, and it's just like it was manufactured brand new at the factory. The team then sends the plates through an x-ray to look for cracks and puts each one through a stress test. Two million plates and counting. It costs us about $16 each to fix. Um, we've saved the Army huge amounts of money. In another warehouse, workers sort through clothing, then create a kit for individual soldiers based on their size and needs. We pick the items for each soldier, we pack them in the boxes, and then we put them on a UPS truck and we ship them out of here. We do this better than anybody in the world. It's the largest scale operation of anybody in the world that does this kind of, uh, of a job. But with the war in Afghanistan finally coming to a close, more equipment is coming in than ever before. The question now is what to do with these former war machines. For that, the military is getting creative. This trailer is a water purification system. It could soon be deployed to natural disaster sites. Humvees and MRAPs are being stripped of their heavy armor and repurposed for civilian use. And the list goes on. What can't be scrapped or salvaged is sold to the highest bidder, often allied militaries, sometimes local law enforcement. It's all about that trying to wring some value out of something that may previously have not had value, specifically the returned items. Anything to save the military a few bucks now that the war drums have finally stopped beating. Reporting in Herlong, California, Megan Lopez, RT. I just like the firepower. I'm a little kid at heart. I like, I like working on the gun. I like loading all the munitions we load. Uh, when we go TDY anywhere, like to Davis Month or anything like that, we load everything we can get our hands on. And it's, it's entertaining. It's hard work, it keeps me busy, but it's fun. Always a welcome sight to U.S. and Allied forces on the ground. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known to its legions of fans as the Warthog. 
While it can be equipped with a wide variety of today's most sophisticated weaponry, the Warthog is, and always will be known for one rather distinct feature. This is the gun. Officially known as the GAU-8 Avenger, the gun is the primary weapon system upon which the entire airframe of the A-10 was built. It is essentially a flying cannon providing 30 millimeters worth of American air power. So this is uh, obviously the business end of the 30 millimeter. Uh, here are the rounds right here, so this is the, uh, the, the casing uh, for the round. And these are actually, they stay within the gun because uh, if you were to spit these out, like a lot of times other guns will, uh, so much ballast and the center of gravity of the aircraft will come off so much that you have to keep it in. Um, a normal combat burst is what we call it. It's a two second uh, squeeze. So with the gun spinning out, that's around 112 rounds for uh, two seconds. With the amount of rounds that we have, which is 1,100, I guess about nine trigger pulls of useful, uh, I guess, combat damage that we can provide. The gun is uh, by far uh, the Hogpod's favorite uh, thing to do. Um, the gun is the most flexible weapon we have, most of the time the most effective, but then we also at the same time too can carry a uh, pretty incredible assortment of different weapons uh, between the Maverick missiles, precision guided uh, munitions, rockets, uh, illumination stuff we can use at night and all different sorts of uh, stuff they're constantly building upon in the hog, but um, the gun is still the most uh, effective, flexible weapon we have. One of the distinctive abilities of the gun is the significant amount of firepower it can put into a target in very short order. The GAU-8 is a complex piece of heavy metal consisting of seven rotating barrels, each seven and a half feet long and weighing 70 pounds apiece. With the total gun assembly, including the feed system and loaded ammo drum, weighing over 4,000 pounds. Airmen working in the aircraft armament systems field are responsible for keeping the weapon system inspected, maintained, and capable of spitting out up to 70 rounds per second. The GAU-8 system holds 1,150 rounds. It fires approximately 3,900 rounds a minute. The first second of fire fires approximately 50 rounds a second, and then from there it accelerates up to 70 rounds a second. One of the best aspects of working on this is hearing back from ground troops where they called it in and uh, the weapon system performed as designed. It's just, it's great to be a part of that. This is the ammunition loading adapter that we use on the 30 millimeter gun on the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the ALA or the Dragon. The ALA is powered by the aircraft's hydraulic power through a flex drive. It attaches to the aircraft with the load head and we have a CIU that attaches to the ammo can that's delivered by ammo. We normally load uh, 575 rounds per can, which adds up to 1150 for the aircraft. And what it does at the same time, we can upload bullets and download bullets. And this times directly to the gun system. One of the training advantages available to A-10s and other aircraft in the Great Lakes region is the proximity of the Grayling Air Gunnery Range in Northern Michigan. A-10 pilots from the 107th Fighter Squadron at Selfridge Air National Guard Base are just a 30-minute flight to the range at Grayling, where pilots face realistic and dynamic training scenarios. There, pilots are able to train with joint terminal attack controllers, placing bombs and bullets right on target. It's an awesome target set uh, that we can go up there and play on. They're constantly changing it around as to what their uh, customers' needs are. It prepares you uh, very well because you can go up there, practice it, you know, kind of training around it. And really when you start to uh, fly over in Afghanistan and start to do the stuff that you're practicing training for up there, you're like, oh yeah, I remember doing this up at, uh, up at Grayling a lot of times. For Warthog pilots, maintainers, and their fellow airmen, ensuring this firepower is available when and where needed is at the core of their duty to their state and nation. The thing I like the most, obviously, is uh, serving the United States uh, military, serving in that capacity, and uh, helping protect the people uh, in America overseas and uh, being a part of that. Our biggest thing that we do uh, as uh, hog pilots, helping out the troops on the ground and uh, you know, providing that aero coverage that they could need at any time.
I just like the firepower. I'm a little kid at heart. I like, I like working on the gun. I like loading all the munitions we load. Uh, when we go TDY anywhere, like to Davis Month or anything like that, we load everything we can get our hands on. And it's, it's entertaining. It's hard work, it keeps me busy, but it's fun. Always a welcome sight to U.S. and Allied forces on the ground. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known to its legions of fans as the Warthog. While it can be equipped with a wide variety of today's most sophisticated weaponry, the Warthog is, and always will be known for one rather distinct feature. This is the gun. Officially known as the GAU-8 Avenger, the gun is the primary weapon system upon which the entire airframe of the A-10 was built. It is essentially a flying cannon providing 30 millimeters worth of American air power. So this is uh, obviously the business end of the 30 millimeter. Uh, here are the rounds right here, so this is the, uh, the, the casing uh, for the round. And these are actually, they stay within the gun because uh, if you were to spit these out, like a lot of times other guns will, uh, so much ballast in the center of gravity of the aircraft will come off so much that you have to keep it in. Um, a normal combat burst is what we call it. It's a two second uh, squeeze. So with the gun spinning out, there's around 112 rounds for uh, two seconds. With the amount of rounds that we have, which is 1,100, I guess about nine trigger pulls of useful, uh, I guess, combat damage that we can provide. The gun is uh, by far uh, the hog pod's favorite uh, thing to do. Um, the gun is the most flexible weapon we have, most of the time the most effective, but then we also at the same time too can carry a uh, pretty incredible assortment of different weapons uh, between Maverick missiles, precision guided uh, munitions, rockets, uh, illumination, stuff we can use at night and all different sorts of uh, stuff they're constantly building upon on the hog, but um, the gun is still the most uh, effective, flexible weapon we have. One of the distinctive abilities of the gun is the significant amount of firepower it can put into a target in very short order. The GAU-8 is a complex piece of heavy metal consisting of seven rotating barrels, each seven and a half feet long and weighing 70 pounds apiece. With the total gun assembly, including the feed system and loaded ammo drum, weighing over 4,000 pounds. Airmen working in the aircraft armament systems field are responsible for keeping the weapon system inspected, maintained, and capable of spitting out up to 70 rounds per second. The GAU-8 system holds 1,150 rounds. It fires approximately 3,900 rounds a minute. The first second of fire fires approximately 50 rounds a second, and then from there it accelerates up to 70 rounds a second. One of the best aspects of working on this is hearing back from ground troops where they called it in and uh, the weapon system performed as designed. It's just, it's great to be a part of that. This is the ammunition loading adapter that we use on the 30 millimeter gun on the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the ALA or the Dragon. The ALA is powered by the aircraft's hydraulic power through a flex drive. It attaches to the aircraft with the load head and we have a CIU that attaches to the ammo can that's delivered by ammo. We normally load uh, 575 rounds per can, which adds up to 1150 for the aircraft. And what it does at the same time, we can upload bullets and download bullets. And this times directly to the gun system. One of the training advantages available to A-10s and other aircraft in the Great Lakes region is the proximity of the Grayling Air Gunnery Range in northern Michigan. A-10 pilots from the 107th Fighter Squadron at Selfridge Air National Guard Base are just a 30-minute flight to the range at Grayling, where pilots face realistic and dynamic training scenarios. There, pilots are able to train with joint terminal attack controllers, placing bombs and bullets right on target. It's an awesome target set uh, that we can go up there and play on. They're constantly changing it around as to what their uh, customers' needs are. It prepares you uh, very well because you can go up there, practice it, you know, kind of training around it, and really when you start to uh, fly over in Afghanistan and start to do the stuff that you're practicing training for up there, you're like, oh yeah, I remember doing this up at, uh, up at Grayling a lot of times. For Warthog pilots, maintainers, and their fellow airmen, ensuring this firepower is available when and where needed is at the core of their duty to their state and nation. The thing I like the most, obviously, is uh, serving the United States uh, military, serving in that capacity, and uh, helping protect the people 
uh, in America overseas and uh, being a part of that. Our biggest thing that we do uh, as uh, hog pilots, helping out the troops on the ground and uh, you know, providing that aero coverage that they could need at any time. This week on a special edition of today's Air Force, we'll take an in-depth look at the Boneyard. Without the parts that we reclaim here at the Boneyard, we'd stop flying. We'll meet the dedicated team that brings new life to old aircraft and hear the nostalgic stories of airmen who flew these planes decades ago. We'll have all those stories and much more right now on today's Air Force. Welcome to a special edition of Today's Air Force. I'm your host, Staff Sergeant Shannon Ofiara. On this special edition of the show, we're taking you to Tucson, Arizona for an inside look at what happens to Air Force planes after they've flown their last mission. Recycling is not a new concept for the Air Force. In fact, we've been doing it throughout our history. And getting new life out of old aircraft is the main purpose of the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group at davis Monthan Air Force Base. Seen from the air, this sprawling 2,600-acre facility is filled with rows of neatly arranged aircraft, many which look almost ready for takeoff. But on the ground, it's a different story. With all sorts of planes in various stages of disassembly, many of them several decades old, it's easy to see how this place got the nickname that most people know it as, the Boneyard. Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz explains how the program got its start. There are more than 4,000 aircraft parked here at the Boneyard. Taken together, these planes would make up the second largest air force in the entire world. But most of these planes will never fly again. They're here to serve a different purpose. The Boneyard is where the Air Force and every other U.S. government agency sends their decommissioned airplanes to be taken apart, reused in other aircraft, or turned over to the Defense Reutilization and Marketing Office to be sold as scrap. The reclamation process at AMARG is able to extract the very last tax dollars from these aircraft after they've reached the end of their useful operational lives. It's a mission that's been helping save taxpayers money since the end of World War II. Shortly after the Second World War, um, there were huge quantities of surplus aircraft scattered all over the world. A lot of them were scrapped where they were in theater, depending on the types. Other airframes were identified as having value for potential future use, or there just wasn't enough capacity in the overseas theaters to, to dispose of them uh, as required. So a lot of them were, were ferried back here. Uh, in particular at Arizona, uh, a lot of B-17s, B-24s, and B-25s were all located here. And the 50s was kind of a, a unique golden age of jet flight and propeller flight. There was an enormous diversity of aircraft being used by, by the Air Force, uh, some more successfully than others. So uh, a lot of them were rapidly outclassed and made obsolete. So, you know, entire production runs of aircraft were brought here for reclamation, like F-84s, uh, B-36s, whereas others were brought here for storage and regeneration. A lot of B-29s were stored here after World War II, and they were pressed back into service for Korea. So up until the early 60s, AMARC was principally an Air Force facility. Uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps maintained their own facility up outside Phoenix at Litchfield Park. Uh, but that was closed up, I think, in 1962, and all those assets transferred down here. So since that time, this has been the complete storage facility for government aircraft. So you find NASA aircraft over there, you find Coast Guard aircraft, Border Patrol, Navy, Marine, Reserve units, training units, 
We have a lot of unique airframes here, a lot of uh, one-of-a-kinds or few-of-a-kinds. Behind us here, there's a B-36 Peacemaker. It's special. It um, is the last production one ever built by, by Convair. Uh, came off the assembly line in 1958, flew for two years, retired out in, in Fort Worth. It's one of only four existing airframes out of nearly 400 built. And one of my personal favorites is the Boeing B-52A um, Stratofortress. It's the oldest buff in existence, a serial number three. Uh, third one off the production line. Uh, it was the principal uh, test airframe um, and carrier mothership for the X-15 program. So nearly all of the early Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo astronauts all dropped off of our uh, off of our B-52A uh, in the X-15 program. Uh, the recently deceased uh, Neil Armstrong was a participant of that program and dropped off our airplane. So it's to my eyes, it's kind of reeking in history. I, I, I really love it. <laughs> As the Air Force has evolved, so has the Boneyard. During the Cold War, America's determination to outpace the Soviet Union in the space race helped fuel an explosion of technological advancement. Almost as quickly as they were introduced, U.S. military aircraft were regularly phased out as newer aircraft flew faster, higher, and farther. The outmoded airplanes were sent here, and the Boneyard's inventory began to swell. With the Vietnam War came a renewed call for even more advanced bombers and fighters. By the time that war started to wind down in 1973, the Boneyard's fleet had reached an all-time high of more than 6,000 aircraft. Today, some 4,000 aircraft still sit in the Boneyard, in various stages of the reclamation process. But the inventory here, much like in today's Air Force, is destined to change. You know, as our Air Force becomes more and more technologically reliant, um, fewer and fewer different types of airframes are being produced. Um, I would expect probably in 20 or 25 years, you'd probably see less than a thousand aircraft over there. And looking out 40 years, there may not be a need for such a large facility. There will always be a need for the facility, but whether or not you're going to find fleets of KC-135s or fields of F-15s, Probably not. You know, there's 200 some odd F-22s. You know, the F-35 hasn't even really come into full operational service yet, so I wouldn't expect to see any of them even twinkling at retirement for 35 or 40 years. You know, but there are probably several hundred of them. So it's it's not going to be the same vast, diverse fleet that you see now. So, you know, it is kind of the end of a golden age, you know. Over the course of its more than 60-year history here in the American Southwest, AMARG has become something of an aviation enthusiast's mecca. Wherever you go in the world, anybody who kind of is interested in aviation or airplanes at all, if you mention Tucson, you know, their eyes are like, oh, that's where the boneyards are, right? I, yeah, yeah, that's where the boneyards are. And the boneyards are here for a very good reason. Turns out the desert climate here in Tucson provides an ideal environment for long-term storage of these aircraft with very little risk of corrosion or other damage from the elements. The ground we're on here uh, is, is fairly unique. It's, it's a very high calcium soil, very stable. When it's dry as it is now, it's as hard as concrete and very, very, very robust. And with the dry weather conditions here, low relative humidity year round, very low rainfall, averaging about six to eight inches a year in the region, there's nothing like uh, tornadoes or hurricanes or that type of thing here to potentially destroy assets. So Tucson was identified as an ideal location for an active reclamation facility. And that year-round sunshine also makes this an ideal location for people to come visit and experience Air Force history in person. Normally, when someone wants to get a good look at some military aircraft, they have to do it through binoculars. But here at the Boneyard, you can get up close and personal with everything from fighters, bombers, tankers, lifters, just about everything the Air Force has flown in the last half century. Our visitors almost universally enjoy the sense of adventure they feel coming out here in the desert to look at airplanes. Uh, we don't rope off our airplanes outside. People are free to get up and stick their head in the wheel well, bump their heads on a propeller, trip over a tie-down cable, run from rattlesnakes. You know, it's, 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 it's the authentic desert experience out here. And it's a big part of our charm and our appeal. One of our sort of taglines is, you know, where you can touch history and we, you know, we, we embrace that. So it's not all just about tearing down old aircraft as newer technology makes them obsolete. Preserving Air Force history has become like a secondary mission at the Boneyard. Along with the Pima Air and Space Museum right across the street, AMARG serves as a sort of monument to the accomplishments and innovations of the past, hoping to inspire America's future pilots, aircraft engineers and astronauts.
you know, our next generation of aerospace innovators, for all you know, could be wandering around here this weekend getting that whiff of hydraulic fluid. If we can expose and encourage young people to come out and, and challenge themselves and, and find a direction through what we do here, however little, I think it's important work. Time and technology march on. The Boneyard will continue in its mission, taking custody of outdated aircraft, salvaging and reusing every part possible. But except for the small handful of aircraft that are preserved for posterity, once a certain model of jet fighter or helicopter or long-range bomber is gone, it's gone forever. A common misconception that a lot of people have with AMARC um, is that there's still World War II aircraft over there. <laughs> you know, we, uh, more often than you think, we, you know, we do get emails or phone calls from people doing family history or have heard legend through one of their uncles or cousins that, oh yeah, there's a boneyard out in Arizona that's got all these World War II aircraft out there. So they call wondering if their grandfather's B-24 is still parked across the street there and we have to generally explain to them no I'm afraid not I mean it was turned into beer cans probably 60 years ago so the idea that a lot of people have is that the boneyard is really a boneyard like a graveyard where it's like it's a very static kind of place where nothing happens it's just a big you know I don't know like some hillbilly farm in the middle of Texas with 400 old tractors laying there it's anything but as you may have seen it's a very heavily engaged dynamic um, busy, busy organization that's tasked with supporting, you know, the mission of the United States Air Force and its allies. And that's a huge amount of work. For today's Air Force from Tucson, Arizona, I'm Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz. Every year, the AMARG team reclaims hundreds of millions of dollars worth of parts to support global warfighting operations. The Boneyard is one of the most cost-effective programs in the entire federal government. For every $1 spent on performing the mission at AMARG, the combination of parts reclaimed and aircraft decommissioned results in nearly $11 being returned to the Treasury, an annual return on taxpayer investment of more than $1 billion. Coming up, a look at the process aircraft go through once retired, when today's Air Force returns. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to be. I don't know what it's like to be in a war. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to be, to be shot at. To be shot at. To be put in harm's way. To put my life on the line. I don't know what it's like. But I do know no one comes back the same. No matter how tough you are, how, how brave, how patriotic, anybody can get hurt. And not just physically hurt. If you're a service member or in a military family and you're feeling hopeless, you're not alone. Please call this number. It's confidential and free. Your family needs you. We need you. Thank you for your service. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. Welcome back to this special edition of today's Air Force. So far we've shared a little bit about the Boneyard, its history, and its importance today to Air Force missions worldwide. Now we'll take a look at what happens to aircraft once they make that final landing at the Boneyard and how some get a second chance. Here's the story. We're bringing this airplane here. It's its last flight. It's being retired from service from the Air Force to the, uh, the Boneyard. It's flown over 20,000 hours, delivered cargo all over the world. It's a sad, Sad day of seeing this airplane uh, being put to rest, but it has had a long life. It's been flying since 1969. What we came here to do is deliver this two ship of B1s to the AMARC. We're sad to see them go. They've been great workhorses, but uh, it's time to put them to sleep. And so uh, we flew in here uh, from Dias Air Force Base, the 9th Bomb Squadron. We're, you know, we're sad to see her go. Uh, she's been a great asset and uh, really good at uh, helping us defend our nation. We got it, you are. 
One of the things that I talk about when I get a chance to talk to the employees of AMARG is I talk about what we do here. Do we store airplanes? We sure do. But that's not what's important about us for the Department of Defense. The most important thing we do is support the warfighter through different technologies and through different operations. We have five major processes that we do here. The first is storage, which most people are familiar with, taking an airplane, preserving it here and keeping it in the desert for future use. Our role is to preserve incoming aircraft. Well, we first started out by taping up all the seams of the engine. That's what we're working on, the B-52 back here behind me. And then after that, we sprayed the first coat of uh, rubberized coating, basically to uh, prevent dust and bird intrusion from getting into the engines and trying to keep them as clean as possible. Most people think we store aircraft just to get rid of them later, but a large number of the aircraft go through what's called regeneration, where we will take them and we will return them the flyable status in order to use them for different programs. For example, we're regenerating F-4s that are used as drones so that our pilots can shoot live missiles at them to identify whether or not they would have been able to hit a target in combat. These aircraft that were produced in, in 66, 67, 68, 69, you're rebuilding the aircraft that was, that was made uh, almost 40 years ago and has spent the last 20 years sitting in the desert in storage. So it's a tremendous task to, to take that airplane uh, out of the desert, uh, rebuild it, and then get it back into flying shape. At least 40% of what we use to regenerate this aircraft will come from another F-4 that's sitting out in the desert. Each and every day we reclaim about 50 parts off of the aircraft here and send them to keep the aircraft fleet that they have right now current and flying. We have tons of great parts out here and no sense in letting them go to waste. So 90% of the stuff we pull is just as good as anything as a brand new part. It's just dirty. There's very few parts that I've pulled since I've been out here that were deemed bad. There is a savings of dollars when we reclaim parts from here at the Boneyard. But that's not actually the biggest benefit. The biggest benefit is the largest number of parts we reclaim cannot be bought. There we go, and that's our job in a nutshell. And therefore, if without the parts that we reclaim here at the Boneyard, we'd stop flying. So it's not as much about money, it's about mission. And the mission would stop if we stopped reclaiming parts from here. Yep, that's it. Yeah. For the most part, we just, we just pull parts and send them in all day, you know, one after another. It's a great job. So a lot of different things occur here all the time. We also do a little bit of disposal, taking aircraft that nobody has a need for anymore within the entire federal government and actually getting rid of them, cutting them up into tiny pieces and getting rid of them. And it takes a total of about, for a C-5, processing and shipping out about a week. We are uh, demilling the fuselage of the C-5. Basically what we do is we just tear it down, uh, we shred it up, and then we send it off to refineries to be processed into other materials. I can see we're uh, driving down the road and some of the aircraft and missing wings and uh, missing the canopy. They think, yeah, it's, it's a junkyard or the boneyard. Yeah, but they don't realize that missing wing might be flying in another aircraft. That missing cockpit window could be in another aircraft. Some of us retired military think that that's it, we don't do nothing else, but no, we continue with our mission, helping out the younger soldiers one way or another accomplish their mission. And now let's take a look at some unique imagery from the Boneyard. The Boeing YAL Airborne Laser Testbed Weapon System now sits decommissioned at the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group at davis Monthan Air Force Base, Arizona. A C-5 Galaxy aircraft sits motionless while clouds pass overhead as it waits to be taken apart.
Rows of F-15 Eagles and F-16 Fighting Falcons are stored and preserved. This allows them to be recalled into active service within 72 hours if needed. The F-4 Phantom II, which served as the principal air superiority fighter for the Air Force for over 20 years, has been a resident of the Boneyard since 1996. And that's Photos from the Boneyard. I'm Staff Sergeant Michael Brady. Coming up, we'll meet airmen who flew these aircraft and their special connection with the Boneyard when today's Air Force returns. The design of the new Airman magazine, it's evolved into something now that's just really amazing to look at and to experience. This new generation that is coming in, they're very plugged into new technology and they're used to getting their news um, on their phone or on their, their tablets and I think it's going to be perfect for those people out there who want that. It comes to life. Your multimedia is your audio, uh, your video, and you can bring this thing to people uh, which we couldn't do with a magazine in the past. To me it's very user friendly. Having it on, the, on your tablet you can take it wherever you want to go. Perfect for the person who's traveling uh, all over the place. But still wants to stay up to date on, on what's going on in their service. It's an amazing new addition to the Air Force. Environmental management systems empower pollution prevention. They empower us to know what is disposable and what is reusable. To rethink what we already do, but with a renewed purpose. And they remind us how all the small things can equal big results. Helping us build a better world one day at a time. With EMS to light the way, each one of us can make a world of difference. EMS, conserve today, secure tomorrow. Blue Acts of Green. Welcome back to today's Air Force. As we've been learning, the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group has an important mission to not only store and preserve aircraft, but also aircraft regeneration, maintenance, and parts reclamation. But the lifeblood of the Boneyard is the dedicated team charged with accomplishing this mission, so let's head to their office. My name is uh, Larry G. Right now you're in the uh, uh, F-4, a drone production hangar. A drone is an unmanned aircraft that, that is flown by a man on the ground by way of radar and radio signals. We, we produce our F-4C models and F-4E models to become full-scale area targets. We tear them apart and we put them back together. We make them flyable. Uh, we take two flights to produce it and then we send it to Mojave where it, where it receives a drone package and becomes a full-scale target. It, it, it's a tremendous task, uh, but we have had several aircraft come through here where members that are working on them used to crew them. Uh, my aircraft actually came through here. I, I actually missed the aircraft tail number 1197. I crewed it while I was at Clark Air Base. It's about 5,000 planes. Um, that are in the process of being decommissioned and taken apart to where you can see behind me to this point to where we get to cut it up. We're uh, demilling the, the fuselage of a C-5. Basically what we do is we just tear it down, shred it up, and then we send it off to refineries to be processed into other materials. Right here at the C-5 here, it takes about four days of work to cut down and to process. Just what we do is we shred it down and then we just ship it to refineries. And I just cut it into areas that I feel like it, it would be easiest for me to handle. I just break it. Throughout this special edition of today's Air Force, we've